It seems Hello? good. Yes, please. Okay. So sorry for the, for the delay. So it's my pleasure to report on uh, research of the last 15 years. There is a beautiful new field uh, on metric measure space and synthetic Ritchie bounds. And it's my pleasure to report on the development of this uh, beautiful theory. So the <clears throat> basic objects we are interested in uh, are metric measure spaces. And before I go into the metric measure space setting, let me first start with the metric spaces. So metric spaces we regard as generalizations of the many manifolds, including singularities, uh, rich geometric structures, so branching, uh, corners, uh, and so forth. And already in the uh, mid of the last century, Alexandrov was able to uh, extract uh, fundamental properties of Riemannian manifolds in terms of metric properties. And so he could uh, characterize upper and also lower sectional curvature bounds in terms of comparison properties for geodesic triangles. And uh, Kromov uh, gave an impressive uh, meaning to convergence of spaces. So he introduced this uh, kromov faustov convergence and uh, this uh, concept of uh, curvature bounds and the concept of convergence perfectly fits together, which uh, can be expressed, for instance, in these uh, basic results that the class of uh, uh, metric spaces with a given lower bound on the curvature is closed under kromov faustov convergence and uh, the class of metric spaces with given lower bound on curvature and given upper bound on dimension and diameter is uh, indeed a compact uh, space. So for metric spaces with curvature bounds in the sense of Alexandrov, uh, many geometric properties can be deduced, uh, which more or less reflect the uh, Riemannian uh, world. Uh, there is also a well-established analysis on these spaces. However, concerning analysis, it is uh, known by fundamental contributions of, of many of the leading people in this field that the crucial quantity is not a bound on, a, on the sectional curvature, but the crucial quantity in many estimates of geometric analysis, spectral calculus, uh, stochastic analysis, and so forth, is a lower bound on the Ricci curvature. The Ricci curvature is the trace of the sectional curvature, and thus uh, bound on the Ricci curvature is less restrictive than any bound on sectional curvature. Uh, it was Gromov who already observed that the previously mentioned compactness result extends to a pre-compactness result if we replace the sectional curvature bound by a lower Ricci curvature bound. Uh, we still have this pre-compactness, but we no longer have an explicit characterization of this compact space. Uh, this led Chiga and Kolding to initiate a very detailed, uh, sophisticated study of limit spaces, so limits of many manifolds satisfying these constraints. And uh, if one wants to go beyond these limits of many manifolds, it is already clear since uh, it was clear since decades by uh, Kromov that the right object to consider are metric measure spaces. And for the talk today, a metric measure space always will mean this is a space X, which has a complete suburban metric on it and a locally finite Borel measure. So this is our setting. And <clears throat> What do we expect from a, from a synthetic notion of Ritchie curvature bounds? First of all, of course, we want that such a synthetic notion uh, is equivalent to the classical Ritchie bound if we are in the smooth setting. Secondly, we expect that uh, such a synthetic notion is stable under convergence. So this is the only way how we extend to extend from limits of, of manifolds to whatever singular spaces. And thirdly, it should be intrinsic or synthetic in the sense that it really is described in terms of these metric measure space quantities as we describe convexity intrinsically or as Alexandrov geometry uh, is uh, defined intrinsically and not in terms of uh, limits of approximating manifolds. And uh, last but not least, of course, we hope, we expect that such a bound allows us to deduce uh, a broad variety of these results, which are known in Romanian geometry and which depend there only on lower rich 
uh, such a concept was proposed by myself and Lot Vilani independently in uh, the uh, early years of this uh, century. Uh, it is the so-called curvature dimension condition, which is a synthetic formulation of a combination of a lower Ritchie curvature bound and an upper bound on the dimension. Both numbers, both are just numbers. So if it's n is not necessarily an integer and it's not necessarily uh, a physical dimension, it's just a parameter. Uh, these concepts uh, are based on the concept of optimal transport. And of course, as most uh, theorists in mathematics, uh, they are not coming from nothing, but they are really based on previous fundamental works by many others. Uh, part of them are mentioned here. Um, this concept is based on, on this uh, theory of optimal transport. And one of the basic uh, notions which we need in the sequel is the uh, Kantorovich Wasserstein distance, uh, probably known to most of you. So we consider on a complete subromatic space, the space of probability measure, which measures which have second moments. And on this space, we define a distance or a metric uh, in the following way we consider the minimal. Uh, L2 norm of a distance function, where we integrate this distance function with respect to a measure on the product space, uh, which we call coupling. And a coupling is any measure on the product space such that its marginals coincide with a given measures mu and nu. So if uh, this is our measure mu and this is the measure nu, so we ask for a measure on the product space such that the projection of the first coordinate gives mu and the projection to the second coordinate gives new. And the typical example is the product measure. So if we said it's always not empty, but if we want to minimize the integral of a distance square function, then it, this is not a, then this is, will not be a good choice. It's much better to try to uh, concentrate for, for mass close to the diagonal. And one can easily verify that the optimal choice of such a coupling in this given case is uh, this measure which sits on the graph of a function. Uh, indeed, this is not a, not a curiosity. This is the typical case that this optimal measure is indeed uh, sitting on a graph of a function. And uh, what else can be said? Uh, this space of probability measure with this uh, counterweight Wasserstein distance then will be a complete subarithmetic space as the underlying space is. It will be compact or length space or an Alexander space of non negative curvature if and only if the underlying space is so. So, again, this will be a nice object. What is important for us is, in particular, that it's a length space, that we can speak of geodesics of curves connecting two different probability measures. And this will be used in order to give a meaning to this Ritchie curvature bound. So, the curvature dimension condition in its symbols form is just a condition on the curvature, no restriction on the dimension. And uh, it uh, reads as follows. We say that a metric measure space XDM satisfies the curvature dimension condition CDK infinity, or simply that it has Ritchie curvature bounded from below by K. If and only if for any pair of measures mu not mu one, there exists a connecting geodesic, geodesic in this canton uh, wasserstein geometry, such that along the geodesic, the Boltzmann entropy is convex up to a correction term. So the most easy definition simply says we have non-negative Ritchie curvature if and only if the Boltzmann entropy is convex. And uh, in this definition, the two ingredients D and M and uh, in the following way, the distance is used to define this Wasserstein distance and thus to define what means a geodesic. And for measure M and as the picture in order to define the Boltzmann entropy. So uh, to summarize what we do, we pass from the underlying metric measure space to the space of probability measure uh, where the underlying metric enters. And then on the space of probability measures, we ask for convexity properties of entropy-like functions. Here indeed it's the entropy, but if we pass to more general condition, it will be a modification. So the general condition is quite involved. Before I pass to that, let me first introduce the curvature dimension condition with curvature zero and uh, bound on dimension n. Uh, this is the convexity fan of a so-called rainy type entropy. Uh, 
So instead of Boltzmann entropy, we now have a Rini type, which is just a power law of a density with an exponent less than one, more precisely one minus one over n. And observe this prefactor here, which uh, uh, is needed in order to be consistent. And <clears throat> this uh, convexity of this Rini type uh, entropy is of particular interest uh, because it allows us also to, to make some simple uh, examples. For instance, if you calculate this Rini type entropy for a uniform distribution of any set, you observe that the Rini type entropy is negative of the nth root of a volume. So if you uh, look on the geodesic contracting a set A towards a point, uh, this is the uh, idea, you have one set, you contract it to a point, and then along this uh, contraction, the nth root of a volume uh, sorry, uh, will be concave. Yeah, we have a minus here. So the end fruit of a volume is concave. This is our characterization of non-negative Ritchie curvature. And this should remind you of a characterization of non-negative sectional curvature, which says that the distance function is con concave if you measure the distance uh, along two geodesics. So it's, it's the measure distance between, uh, let's say, alpha t and, and beta t, where alpha and beta are two geodesics emanating from a common point. And the, the uh, philosophy behind that is, roughly speaking, that sectional curvature bounds are, in a synthetic way, always expressed as inequalities between distances, whereas Ritchie curvature, in a synthetic way, is characterized by inequality between volumes. And if you think a little bit more even, the end fruit of a volume in physical terms is of an order length. So this is uh, roughly speaking uh, the trace of this condition, which is the Riemannian counterpart. But of course, this is more of a heuristic for rigorous definition is simply this uh, concavity or convexity of a Rini type entropy. But here you might have an interpretation why this is consistent with the Alexandrov geometry picture. So end fruit of a volume, compared with a distance, both being lengths, but this is a mean value of lengths and this is just a length. And the more general uh, situation is, looks a little bit ugly. So if you have a curvature dimension condition with parameters k and n, both arbitrary uh, real numbers, n larger than one, uh, then it's still this Rayleigh type uh, entropy, which we look in between, but at the end point, it's no longer one minus T and T, which we would need for the concavity inequality here, but it's the so-called distortion coefficient, a coefficient which is well known to people in Riemannian geometry or in calculus with Jacobi fields. Uh, these are these uh, coefficients which express the growth of uh, lengths uh, along evolutions of Jacobi fields. And this is the general curvature dimension condition for interpretation, as I mentioned, is that this is a lower bound, should be interpreted as a lower bound on Ritchie curvature and combined with an upper bound on dimension. In Lot Villani's original approach, they only treated this case where, where either k is zero or n is infinity. And uh, in this case, of course, the distortion coefficients look much nicer. They are just these uh, coefficients which we know from the convexity inequality. Uh, we have an exact uh, equivalence in the Riemannian case, namely the CDKM holds true if and only if we have this uh, Ritchie curvature bound and dimension bound. And besides many manifolds, there are plenty of further uh, geometric objects, uh, weighted Riemannian uh, spaces, Ritchie limit spaces in the sense of Chile coding, Alexandrov spaces, even if this sounds uh, obvious, this was quite a challenge to be proven, uh, Finster manifolds. And if you are willing to extend the scope a little bit, then also Wiener space and configuration spaces uh, would fit into this uh, uh, class. For Wiener space and configuration space, you should extend the setting in order to allow all the distances which are pseudo distances. Yeah? Because from the Wiener space, you would choose the Cameron Martin metric, which is not uh, a finite metric anymore. And what is also important and which also uh, is in some sense a, a, a wish uh, towards a synthetic definition. This uh, definition of curvature bounds allows to pass to limits, products, cones, uh, 
suspensions, warp products, and so on. So there is a huge machinery of producing new space out of given ones. And <clears throat> the next criterion which we want to, to uh, ask or to check for a synthetic definition of curvature bounds is whether this really allows to deduce uh, some geometric meaningful estimates. And the most important estimates to begin with are the uh, body Myers diameter bound and the Bishop Comer volume growth estimate. So, uh, and both hold true with a sharp constant, sharp in the sense that they are equalities in the case of spheres. And these are the sharp estimates from Riemannian geometry. The first only is meaningful if K is positive and N is finite. Uh, it says if we have a curvature dimension condition with positive K and finite N, then this set is in already a bounded set. And uh, as a further consequence, it's a compact set. And secondly, we have a Bishop Cromer volume growth estimate, which allows us to estimate the volume of small spheres uh, in terms of the volume of large spheres uh, by the corresponding ratio in model spaces. And model spaces could be uh, just spheres if n is an integer, or it could be just this number if n is a fractional number. And of course, if k is uh, negative, you should replace the sign by hyperbolic sign. Uh, direct consequence of this volume growth estimate is that balls at most growth like exponential functions. So this is the consequence of this hyperbolic sign function. Uh, what is interesting for metric measure space for the general curvature dimension condition is that also in the case where we have no bound on the dimension, we can deduce a, a growth bound for the volume of balls. And uh, surprisingly, this is no longer bound of a type e to the constant times r. Uh, without dimension bound, the maximal growth is e to the constant times r squared. And indeed, such a growth uh, will also be attained. So the, this is the infinite dimensional version in some sense of Bishop Gromov, which was, as far as I know, uh, not known before and only came up uh, with the study of metric measure spaces and dimension bounds. Uh, there is a broad variety of further inequalities from geometric analysis, more or less uh, each inequality which you find in a textbook on remaining geometry could be extended, provided this inequality only requires bounds on the Ricci curvature from below. Uh, there was one inequality which was really very demanding and couldn't prove for many, many years. This was the famous Levy Komov isoparametric inequality. And only recently, uh, Cavaletti Montino succeeded to prove the Levy Komov inequality, which says that uh, whenever you have a subset E of a CDKN space and uh, you choose a, a, a cap. Uh, in a model space such that the uh, relative volume of the set E and the cap is uh, the same, then the uh, volume of a boundary of E is larger than the volume of a uh, boundary of, of a cap. So this was, uh, this took quite a long time. Uh, so there have been more than 10 years in between and uh, many other inequalities could be proven much easier. Um, the next property which we want to, to verify uh, for uh, synthetic Ritchie bound is that this condition should be stable. Uh, indeed, this characterization of Ritchie curvature in terms of convexity of entropy is uh, in some sense very easily seen to be stable. And, and this was uh, roughly speaking the starting point of all the development that uh, it was observed that this is uh, stable. And the argument is, quite easy. So what we have to check, if we are on the limit space, we take two probability measures and we ask whether there is an intermediate point which has less entropy than the convex combination of the entropies at the end point. So for end points, we approximate by probability measures on the approximating spaces. They have this curvature dimension condition, so they allow a midpoint in between with entropy dominated by the convex combination of the entropies at the end points. And uh, these midpoints converge to a midpoint on the limit space. This is just metric geometry. Uh, limits of midpoints are midpoints. And Boltzmann entropy is lower semi-continuous. Also on varying spaces. So of course you have to, to, to uh, care, take care a little bit of, of technicalities, but essentially it is the lower semi-continuity uh, 
of a Boltzmann entropy along uh, sequences of spaces, which guarantees that uh, you finally find a midpoint uh, such that the entropy of it is uh, dominated by the entropy of the endpoints. And this is the convexity of the entropy and thus the rigid bound of a limit space. For the notion of stability, of course, we, we have to, to agree on a notion of convergence. There is a well-established notion of measured of Hausdorff convergence, which is quite okay in some sense. It's not really optimal uh, because it's not a notion of uh, isomorphism classes. In some sense, a better concept is uh, uh, topology coming from a transportation distance, which I will introduce in a minute, but there is not that much difference, uh, which is important uh, by now. Uh, having at hand the stability result and uh, using the compactness argument of uh, or pre compactness argument of Gromov, which easily extends to metric measure spaces, we can deduce uh, very quickly a compactness result, uh, saying that the space of all metric measure space satisfying curvature dimension condition for given parameters k and n and uh, having an upper bound L is compact. So this is then the compactness result, which corresponds to the famous pre-compactness result of, of Gromov. Now, Gromov said, okay, if you, if you look on this within the class of manifold, you get a pre-compact class, and now we have a compact class of metric measure spaces. Um, okay, what is, what is the distance which I mentioned? So uh, the distance which I, which I have in mind is the so-called transportation distance. The transportation distance measures the distance between coupled uh, particles or, or, or points. So uh, we ask for a coupling of the meshes as before. So this is the M and this coupling of the meshes tells us which point uh, should be transported to, to which, so X not to X1. And for these pairs of points, we just uh, measure the distance. But now the distance has to be measured not only in X0 or in X1, we have to measure distance for points moving from here to there. And this is the idea of a, of a coupling of the distances. We ask for distance on the uh, union of these two spaces, which coincides with a given distance on each of these uh, uh, pieces. And you also could say if this is a the best embedding of a two spaces into a metric space uh, and then just looking on the Wasserstein distance in this embedding and uh, choosing embedding in an optimal way. This gives a, a distance on the space of metric measure space. And as usual in integration theory, uh, convergence with respect to the LP distance is just convergence with the L not distance and convergence of a P moments. The, the, L not version, LP version for P uh, infinity and P less than one can be defined uh, by slightly modifying that. Uh, so you drop the square root uh, or P fruit, or if P equal zero, you choose this counterpart of a Kaifan metric. There's another distance which is of particular interest, which is uh, closely related, but, but um, not really equivalent. This is the so-called distortion distance. And here we do not measure the, the distance of transport. We measure the distance, the, the difference between distances. Huh? Here we have a distance in the, in the uh, space X naught. And here we have a pair of particles and we measure the distance in D1. And we choose two pairs of particles uh, with this optimal coupling. And again, uh, delta P and delta naught are the same up to convergence of moments. And it turns out that the convergence with respect to D naught with delta naught is the same. And it's also the same as convergence with Komov's Fox metric. There is an important difference. This, the, the distortion distance here is not complete, whereas the transportation distance is complete. Why are we interested in the distortion distance? OK, this is just because this also allows us a, a, a fascinating excursion, namely the distortion distance makes the space of metric measure spaces to a geodesic space of non-negative curvature. So this really makes this class of all metric measure spaces, let's say with mass one, uh, to uh, Alexander spaces up to the fact that it's not complete. Uh, it's, it's a geodesic space with non-negative curvature. The completion is really bigger I won't have time to go into details here, but it has non-negative curvature. 
And on the level of endpoint spaces, uh, you could even characterize this as a remaining orbifold, again, of non negative curvature. True. So it's obtained really just by quotient operations of, of a flat space, indeed. Now, the next question, uh, which should be addressed for such a synthetic definition of Ritchie curvature is whether it has the local to global property. So this is one of the fundamental properties in, in um, related with curvature. So curvature allows us to make conclusions from local uh, information you can deduce global estimates. The curvature which we define a priori is defined globally, which is a little bit strange. Huh? We, we say whenever we have two measures, we can find a transport which is convex along the whole way of its of its transport. It was clear from the very beginning if k is zero or n is infinite, then uh, this curvature dimension condition has the local to global property, uh, since this is just a, a simple convexity property, and convexity has the local to global property. Uh, with the curvature dimension condition, uh, with its complicated distortion coefficients, it was uh, quite uh, mysterious. Uh, as an intermediate step with Bakker, I, I introduced the reduced curvature dimension condition with uh, slightly modified uh, parameters. And for this, we could prove a local to global property. And we could prove that the local uh, property of a reduced curvature dimension condition is the same as the local version of a curvature dimension condition, but the full local to global uh, was unclear again for, for more than 10 years. And it was Cavaletti and Milman who only recently proved the globalization theorem uh, for with minimal assumptions. And this is based on a very powerful localization technique which uh, Cavaletti and Montino developed in recent years and which is based on the needle decomposition of Klantek. So these are very sophisticated techniques uh, originally coming from, from smooth calculus, but now extended to metric measure space calculus. And the next property, the next question we want to address is what can we learn concerning analysis on metric measure space from these curvature conditions? And to do analysis or to deduce analytic estimates, um, we need a Laplacian or a heat uh, equation or at least an energy functional. And for the heat equation, the traditional way would be to start with the energy and you say the heat equation is a gradient flow in L2 space of the energy. We should uh, stop a brief moment. Is it clear what, what, what is the energy on a metric me measure space? Indeed, this is clear by the work of uh, Jeff Cheeger already 20 years ago. We know that we can define the energy uh, as the integral of a square of a minimal weak upper gradient, and also by recent work of uh, Ambrose Chili Savary and uh, various other people, we, we have a complete picture now that this uh, energy defined in, in, the, in the tradition of a Finnish school coincides also with a relaxation of this simple minded object where we simply integrate the square of a local Lipschitz constant. But then we have to take the relaxation, which means the limb in the L2 space. Both approaches coincide, both uh, provide us with a, with a reasonable functional, and then we have semi groups and gradient flows associated with that. Um, there's another approach to heat equation based on this idea of uh, Chotan, uh, Kinderlehrer, and Otto, namely to regard the heat equation as the gradient flow of uh, Boltzmann entropy in uh, the space of probability measures. And you can ask whether this uh, equivalence also holds true in a more general setting. And indeed, this is true. And it first was verified in, in a quite uh, large number of different settings. So for manifolds, for things of manifolds, Alexander spaces, and so forth. Uh, but uh, the main theorem, which I want to uh, mention here, is uh, due to impose a Chile summary, which say that both approaches coincide whenever this Boltzmann entropy is k convex, sin convex. And this is exactly our curvature condition. So whenever we have a rigid bound, which means that whenever the entropy is convex, semi-convex to be more precise, then uh, gradient flow of entropy coincides with gradient flow of energy. I already have formulated this with functions. Typically, you would formulate this with measures, and we regard this is a density of a measure in the space of probability measures. Uh, here, I mentioned various other uh, 
settings which are in the meantime uh, proven, which go far beyond uh, spaces which satisfy curvature dimension condition. But for us at the moment, this is the basic uh, setting which we will consider. And uh, note that this also holds true in settings like Finsler spaces. Yeah, in, in, uh, for on Finsler spaces, indeed, the heat equation is a nonlinear uh, equation, and the Laplacian is a nonlinear partial differential operator. And uh, to proceed, we will, however, restrict from now on that the energy is quadratic, or in other words, that the Laplacian and the heat flow are linear uh, operators. And these spaces are called uh, infinitesimally Hilbertian, with uh, following the tradition of uh, Nicola Chili. And for fee spaces, uh, we have a, a quite complete interpretation of these curvature bounds, both in this Lagrangian language, defined in terms of uh, geodesics in the space of probability measures, uh, Boltzmann entropy, and so forth, and in the Eulerian picture, which is uh, roughly speaking, uh, uh, abstract formulation of Bochner's inequality, you always can write it in this way. Of course, you have to take care of domains and uh, so forth. And it coincides with an abstract formulation provided by Baku and Emery already in the 80s of the last century. So uh, the curvature condition uh, in, in the language of Baku and Emery simply says that gamma 2 is larger than k times gamma. And if there's a dimension constraint, this is a um, uh, sharpening by this uh, expression, but, but this is the Eulerian formulation, which is comparable to the convexity, k-convexity of the Boltzmann entropy. And it is well known since many years that this uh, uh, gamma calculus leads to estimates uh, for the gradient of a heat semigroup, gradient estimates. And on the other hand, it's very uh, intuitive, uh, to believe that a K convex functional uh, provides us with gradient flows which have this contraction uh, property. So if you forgot for N, then uh, if this inequality is, is an intuitive consequence. Uh, technically, it's much more complicated. It's not so, so obvious to, to prove it in this general setting. Um, and finally, there is an equivalence between transport estimates and gradient estimates uh, for so-called Kuwata duality which allows us to pass between these two estimates. And this provides us then with this uh, very far reaching equivalence of uh, Lacanagean and Eulerian characterization. And this is at the heart of all the subsequent uh, results. So we have uh, plenty of uh, analytic inequalities and I only can mention some of them. So of course the most basic one uh, known from the very beginning is the Poincare or Lichnerowitz inequality which provides us with a sharp estimate for the spectral gap in the case of a positive K. And uh, really in both cases for finite N or for infinite N. And for finite N, we have uh, then uh, important further results, for instance, Laplace comparison by Nicola Chili, the Bochner inequality as already mentioned. And as a consequence of the Bochner inequality, there is this whole machinery of a Li Yao calculus which leads to differential Harnack inequality, Gaussian heat kernel estimates. We further have so sharp Sobolev inequalities, Chiga inequality, Guse inequality, and so forth. And um, in the case of uh, infinite dimension parameters, there is the log Sobolev inequality, Tanakura, Van Harnack inequality, and the two inequality. And the <clears throat> final. Uh, class of results uh, of fundamental importance, uh, splitting theorem and rigidity results. So um, the splitting property is one of the fundamental property or consequences of non-negative Ritchie curvature in the Riemannian setting. And here in the singular setting, the splitting theorem due to Nicola, Nicola uh, Chile says that uh, if a space satisfies uh, uh, the RCD CON condition, so if, if it has zero, lower bound for the curvature and uh, n upper bound for the dimension. And if it contains a line, a geodesic of infinite length, then it, uh, it splits off a uh, linear factor. So it's a product of uh, R and another RCD space. And 
the counterpart with finite dimension is the maximal diameter theorem, which says if we have a, a space which has a lower bound uh, of a curvature n minus one, and thus a, a diameter less than pi, if it really has time at a pi, then it's a spherical suspense, suspension of a lower dimension space. And uh, in the smooth case, it's indeed possible to complete, conclude that it's a sphere. This is not true in, in the singular case. So these suspensions could be indeed more complicated spaces. Um, uh, far reaching uh, consequence is possible if we look on this maximum spherical size theorem, uh, saying that uh, the integral of a cause of a distance being uh, non positive implies for these class of spaces already that they have to be for round sphere. And uh, <clears throat> a counterpart to, to this maximal diameter theorem is the Oppatas theorem, where instead of a diameter, we look on the spectral gap. So if the spectral gap is maximal with respect to these possible choices, then again, a linear factor has to split off. And the uh, uh, Oppatas theorem indeed allows also for infinite dimensional version saying that if we have a RCBK infinity space with positive K and which has factor gap K, then it splits off a Gaussian factor. And the uh, structure theories, uh, which are in some sense consequences of a splitting theorem. So you split off iteratively linear factors, roughly speaking, says that uh, an RCDK n space is uh, a sum of uh, finitely many spaces, each of which is by Lipschitz equivalent to uh, subsets of uh, k-dimensional Euclidean space. And actually, this was uh, the, the first result by Montino Neighbor, and then by Bruy and Semula, the sharpening, actually there is only one of these spaces. So the RCDK n space up to a zero set is by Lipschitz equivalent to a uh, k dimensional Euclidean space for some k. And again, all of his, all of his uh, insights uh, did not come from nowhere. They, they rely on a number of important contributions by other people. And <clears throat> interesting result uh, or consequence by Lutscher and Stadler confirms this conjecture that a two dimensional uh, metric measure space should be an Alexander space. And finally, Prue and Semula could uh, uh, provide deeper insights on, on the boundary. It was not clear for quite uh, some years how what is a good definition of boundary. Uh, they provided now a very powerful definition of boundary and uh, proved the rectifiability of a boundary uh, in terms of n minus one dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, now let me come to some uh, extensions of this uh, setting of uh, synthetic rigid uh, bounds. So there are quite a number of recent extensions and important applications. So uh, one extension which I will address are uh, towards time dependent spaces and for links to or relation to rigid flow. Another extension concerns uh, really the full development of a second order calculus and also the uh, counterpart of upper Ricci curvature bounds. And uh, thirdly, we will address the question of distribution valued lower Ricci curvature bounds instead of constant lower Ricci curvature bounds. So concerning time dependent spaces, uh, there are three uh, directions uh, which we could address. Namely one is this uh, concept of super rich flows, which could be regarded as uh, parabolic counterparts to spaces with uh, lower rich bounds. Uh, if we want to uh, attain sharp results uh, comparable to the Liao calculus on, on static spaces, this requires a precise upper and lower bound on, on the curvature. So uh, this then will uh, be close to, to recent work of neighbor Hasselhofer, Kumada, uh, Lee, or of course also to the important recent works by Bamler, Kleiner, Lott on Ritchie flow on singular spaces. And uh, thirdly, there is a uh, very interesting recent development uh, 
concerning uh, synthetic Mitchell curvature bound uh, in time-like directions on Lorentzian manifolds. And if you impose both-sided Ritchie bounds, this leads to characterization of Einstein equations in general relativity. I only will address uh, the, the first of these topics and give some very basic uh, concepts here. So one of the interesting aspects is if you go to the time-dependent setting and let us uh, assume for the moment or for simplicity that the space is fixed and only metric and measure will change in time and assume some regularity, then we can uh, prove, this is joint work with Eva Kopfer, that the heat equation can be regarded as a gradient flow in forward direction for the giga energy and observe that the energy function is time depending and also the geometry is time depending. And if you uh, consider this heat equation on functions, by duality, this gives you a flow on measures acting in backward di direction. And the flow in backward direction acting on measures turns out to be the gradient flow for the Boltzmann entropy. Uh, so forward direction on functions, backward direction on measure, and then you have this uh, uh, famous uh, duality between gradient flow of energy and gradient flow of uh, entropy. But now indeed, uh, it's, it's fundamental to distinguish the time direction. And, and sorry, and, and this holds true if and on or provided the underlying space holds a super rich flow. And what is a super rich flow? Just very brief some definitions. In the smooth case, a super rich flow is just a family of many manifolds which do not evolve necessarily as, as a rich flow, but which satisfies this inequality. So the time derivative of a metric tensor uh, and the rich tensor itself are related by this inequality between quadratic forms. And uh, <clears throat> if we want to pass to a, to a singular setting, uh, the right objects to consider are families of Boltzmann entropies with varying measures in spaces of probability with varying distances. And the appropriate notion of super rich flow then is that a family of metric measure space will be called rich flow, super rich flow if at each time uh, slice the slope of, uh, of entropy at the initial point and at the end point uh, differs at most by the time derivative of a square of a, of a mass assigned distance between the end points. And it's not clear at the moment why this is a good definition. We call this the dynamic convexity of a Boltzmann entropy, but it turns out that this exactly co coins or is equivalent to a contraction of a heat flow in backward time direction. It's uh, equivalent to a gradient estimate in forward direction. And in the smooth case, it's exactly this inequality of super rich flows. Uh, let me then switch to the second topic, which I wanted to mention here, the second order calculus. Uh, this is a far reaching theory developed by, by Chile, which uh, provides us with a complete rich tensor, even a remaining tensor. It allows to define heat flow on one forms, uh, harmonic maps in the metric spaces and many other things. And uh, another important development uh, of recent years is that uh, also other rich curvature bounds allow uh, or can be characterized in a synthetic way, for instance, by means of partial L concavity of a Boltzmann entropy or by the heat kernel asymptotic. So for the for the lower bound, we estimate this quantity here from above uniformly. And for the upper rich curvature bound, we estimate it from below asymptotically. So this is, uh, in this respect, of course, these upper bounds are much weaker. We only have uh, these uh, inequalities in an asymptotic way. But for instance, uh, using this definition in a joint work with, with Alba, we could verify the following. If we have a metric cone, which has both sided rich curvature bounds, then this has to be flat. And this really provides an important advantage of this estimate towards many other characterization, both in the second order calculus or in, in this function calculus of neighbor, because in all previous uh, calculus, the, the singularity, the curvature in the, in the tip of a cone was ignored, whereas this definition really uh, 
also sees the curvature sitting in the tip of a cone. And <clears throat> okay, I think I should switch this and I pass to this last direction, namely distributional value to Ritchie bounds. And what we have in mind is that instead of uh, constant Ritchie curvature bounds, we pass to a variable Ritchie curvature bounds. So, and instead of this gradient estimate, now in probabilistic terms, we would expect or we expect uh, and we obtain a gradient estimate where the variable Ritchie curvature bound uh, shows up in a Feynman cuts type formula. Uh, and from this expression, it's clear that this K also could be. Um, a singular function, for instance, Carter class function, and there's a beautiful application of this concept uh, by Gunnis and Renese towards so called molecule metric measure space, which are ground state transformations of Hamiltonians, and where this case indeed then a Carter class uh, singular potential. And another extension uh, comes if one wants to study heat flow with boundary conditions. If a domain is uh, convex, everything is nice because this effect can be ignored. But if we study normal boundary condition with non-convex boundary, we have to add here a singular contribution coming from a, a lower bound for the second fundamental form in the smooth case. And in the non-smooth case, indeed, there is also a synthetic definition of a lower bound for the second fundamental form. And this formula still holds true. So in the smooth case, the capital L is the local time. In the singular case, it's just the continuous additive functional uh, associated with, a, with the boundary measure of this non-convex set Y. And this, of course, gives us a very new and uh, a new and very interesting extension. And if we want to combine all of this, this leads to the distribution value to lower Ritchie curvature bound where the Ritchie curvature bound is just a distribution in neg negative Sobolev space of uh, order minus one. And typical examples are K times uh, volume measure or L times surface measure in these cases. And we can get the right gradient estimates of this type and, and uh, similar other objects. And um, so we have seen these extensions and uh, let me finally mention various other applications uh, and extensions, uh, most importantly, perhaps to discrete spaces. And there is a huge theory uh, going on, uh, initiated by uh, Maas and Milke, who in invented this concept of synthetic Ritchie curvature bounds for discrete spaces, despite the fact that there, is, uh, there are no geodesics on this space. Uh, there is application to non commutative spaces, there is a very interesting work uh, towards curvature dimension condition with negative uh, dimension parameter, uh, which then leads to a larger class of examples. And there is a very interesting application also to uh, heat flow with durable boundary conditions, uh, which is very closely related to the concept of doubling of metric measure spaces. And indeed, doubling of metric measure space itself is a challenging uh, open problem in the theory of metric measure space is a, a very recent partial result is by Kapovic, Keller and myself, where we can prove uh, the uh, curvature dimension condition for doubling of convex subset, if in addition we have a structure of an Alexander space. Okay, with this I want to close and once again, sorry for the, for the chaos in the beginning and uh, yeah. Thank you for your attention.